Welcome to The Last Picture House, the podcast devoted to films that have finally found their way into Japanese cinemas. I'm your host, Marcus Lovett, and I'm joined by fellow film buffs Maria Suzuki and Christopher Gibbs. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hello. This week, we're at the 31st Tokyo International Film Festival. We'll be discussing Eduardo De Angelis's The Vice of Hope, which is screening in competition, and Paolo Sorrentino's Loro. Each October, Tokyo plays host to the International Film Festival, one of the few times local audiences get to jump the lengthy waiting period for new releases. Maria, what are some of the highlights of the festival this year? This year, I think there are some uh, films that recently won Venice, like Roma, Cuaron's uh, newest film, uh, also uh, Yorgos Lantimos' new movie. Personally, I'm very excited to see a lot of Italian movies because the film's artistic director is, is usually partial, maybe it's a, just a, a personal opinion, but it's partial to Italian cinema. So mm -hmm. there's always interesting uh, releases from my country. And um, how's the event organized? Yeah, so um, first of all, it's a competition uh, type of festival. So you have a main competition with films uh, selected this year from 1,800 entries. So wow. this year is the record. Last year was 17-something, but this year is like more than 1,800 entries. Okay. And uh, this is the only festival in Asia that allows competition, not just from Asia, but from, from all over the world. Uh, second, Tokyo Film Festival loves subsections. So it has a lot of sections, more than 10, like uh, Crosscut Asia, Japan Now, and other things that are like world premiere and special screening, and I still haven't figured out what's the difference hmm. between a special screening and a first-time screening. Uh, so, yeah, and this year, I think that they wanted to uh, give it a musical theme mm -hmm. because uh, the film that was uh, selected for opening the festival was A Star is Born uh, with Lady Gaga. So there was a whole uh, music vibe. So there were a lot of uh, documentaries um, about music from all over the world. Um, the schedule was released only 10 days before. Uh, so the films were... Um, Advertise. So what films are they going to be showing? The list was available from the 1st of October. But the actual calendar, so seeing if you can attend a film, well, you had to wait at least another week. Getting so there's a very short window. Yes, there's a short window to organize yourself and, uh, for example, open your schedule or see right. if you're... Uh, since a lot of the films have um, screenings in the afternoon or maybe very late in the evening, so they're not very practical hours. And plus for the tickets, with the tickets you have a very short window to buy them. If you want to have like good seats and uh, you want to secure your, your, your seat for your film that you're waiting for. Yeah, so um, every year there's this kind of uh, ritual that you go, <laughs> you go into where you have to sit down with your computer, wait for a particular film to be available. So some films are available on one particular day at a particular time, and other films they are released maybe the next day at 4 o'clock. <laughs> That's why I was talking about the subsections, because you have to locate your film in the section and see when this section starts its sales. Oh, I see. So the subsection itself actually is part of the festival in its own right. Are those subsections organized in any logical way, or are they just kind of there you know. Straight to it. You know exactly what to ask, Chris. That's why we have you here, <laughs> asking the tough questions. Uh, let me tell you, Chris, if there is a logic, it is unknown to me. <laughs> <laughs> because take two films that were released about the same time, like The Favorite by Yorgos Lantimos and uh, Roma by Cuaron. I don't see any reason for separating them and putting them in a different section, meaning that I have to uh, do a countdown and wait for different hours and different days to buy them. The only thing that I can think of is that they're worried about the demand on their servers, which are, which are clearly stressed. So if they have too many films at the same time, I think maybe there's a technical concern that they're not going to be able to get those tickets out there. It is really, you know, it's, it's really unusual. I've been to a few of these types of events elsewhere, whether it's a film festival uh, in Melbourne where I'm from, 
or uh, theatre festivals. And typically what happens is you have several weeks in which to choose the films and then there's a booking period of another few weeks. Then the festival happens. Often you will actually line up for films. There'll be general admission tickets. Here every seat is officially um, uh, chosen. So you have a, a row number, you have a seat number. Whereas the Melbourne Film Festival, you'll have general admission. Everyone will line up. So there are people who have passes they can go into um, the screening before everybody else. They've, they've paid the big money, mm-hmm. and or they might be a sponsor. And uh, uh, the, the rest of us, the, the rest of the people who have bought tickets on a, and a kind of a mini pass or a, uh, for just that particular film, you line up outside and then you get in. Now, they only sell enough seats, that they, the, the number of seats they have. So they're not going to be selling seats they don't have. But yes, you'll get in there and some cinemas will have a bar. So people will go to the bar and you'll be like, is that seat free? Excuse me, can you just tell me? Uh, and, you know, it, it actually pays to be by yourself at that thing, uh, at the, the Melbourne International Film Festival, because you can kind of, you know, walk to the front. If you get in early enough, you usually get a good seat. But uh, if you're in a group, you know, you get pushed to the back. The, the ticketing system here is really different. I'm not sure if, you know, this is one of those kind of cultural... Um, cultural considerations would the tickets sell if people were lining up something that i wanted to touch on a little bit because um, like you said in the melbourne international film festival that's part of a circuit that travels throughout southeast asia i believe not or? not necessarily no the the films that come to melbourne are usually films that have been chosen for that festival or submitted to that festival oh, okay the thing that's characteristic of the melbourne film festival is a lot of the films have just come from Khan. so the timing God. is that they play in Khan, they get a big, you know, a lot of exposure there, and then people clamor to go and see those particular films when they're uh, showing in Melbourne. So it's in the middle, of, it's in the, the Australian winter, so um, you know, roughly August. Oh, wow. Okay, that actually makes a lot of sense then, because, you know, people seeing the hype for these other movies and they want to check it out and, you know, halfway around the world. I guess with the Tokyo Film Festival, it seems like it's almost... Um, I'm not sure how to say this, but it seems like it's almost out of any particular circuit. Like it's out of the loop, so to speak. My feeling about this is that when there are big events in Tokyo, and I I think it's unfair to pick on the Tokyo Film Festival, but when there are events like, uh, you know, theater festival, jazz festival, any kind of big cultural event in the city, it's very hard to know about it. And, Mm. you know, there's... (laughs) I put a lot of it down to um, marketing, limited marketing budgets or marketing in places where, you know, it may have a lot of exposure, but not necessarily to your audience. So there are posters in the trains, but that's not necessarily where the, the film festival audience are going to find out about the festival. There's the, the, the kind of word of mouth aspect is really hard with any, to- with any kind of cultural event here because it's, it's really hard to hear about it and go, hey, I really need to see something, especially when you've got like a 10-day period in which to prepare yourself. I mean, I was, I was moving work around to make sure I could go and see some of the films. Mm. I just want to take that point about lining up for a second. Do you think the Japanese would line up for a film festival? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't think they would. So I mean, if they had general admission tickets, do you think they would stand in big lines outside the cinema waiting? I think the movie itself would have to be very very popular they'd have to have known about it from more than 10 days prior but that being said if it was something that was very highly anticipated Mm. i can see that i can i can see that in the current form i think maybe just a little more time to build anticipation for the movie or the roster of movies would definitely get more people interested and you'd see more lines, more crowds, mm. uh, more of that general interest. Because I, I know what my friends who work in, um, in, in the arts in Australia would say. They would say, you don't know exactly who's coming until the very last minute. So it's very hard to build that anticipation. However, I think there are ways to work around it. One thing is to have particular slots that are just open. So the movie is chosen once the festival has started. Hmm. And then you can have, if there's a really popular film, you can open up more slots. And the other thing, of course, is, is the idea of community, that with very short window for people to find out about it uh, and be in contact with the marketing, you know, there's not a chance really to build up that sense of community, this, that sense of event. It's very hard to kind of get that vibe happening. 
one thing that I've seen work really well elsewhere is, you know, using social media and actually projecting the social media, like the, the Instagram posts and the Facebook posts, on screen while you're sitting down. I think that's a great idea because there's a lot of、um, waiting around and、uh, with this kind of elevator music that it's a little bit boring. The, the funeral、really. music, I、yeah. think we call it. <laughs> okay.、Uh, so I think that it would be interesting, but the problem is deeper because I don't know how much media、um, movement is there around surrounding films. Like on Twitter, like I think it's all related to the, ex- the to the expectation thing. So if there is enough people that are going to be tweeting around a movie because they're waiting for it, and then there there might be this kind of discussion on screen. But what I'm afraid is if they tried it, probably there wouldn't be、uh, tweeting enough, or there wouldn't be enough material. I think it should be it should be tried. And Maria, did you go to any of the Q and A's this year, or any of the big kind of events like the post show Q and A sessions, the workshops?、Uh, this year, I went to、uh, a Q and A of a movie that we'll be talking about a little later, which is The Vice of Hope,、mm-hmm. uh, with、um, director and actress, plus a Mexican film that we're going to talk about in the next episode.、Uh, also, there there was the cast, producers, and director. Do you have any tips for people who are trying to get tickets next year? Well, definitely study your program. Study where your movie is located, and、um, then、uh, write down which of the date and、uh, an hour. Because some some of them would be like Sunday from two or Sunday from four. So、uh, write down those and just prepare yourself with a lot of patience, because you're gonna be refreshing a lot. My advice is to make friends who buy the tickets and. Be very nice to them. Not too many friends, because there's a limit. You can only buy two tickets. Tokyo Film Festival, do something about it. At least three tickets. So find lonely friends, and be nice to them. Okay, so Maria,、uh, the first film we're going to talk about today is a film you saw called The、yes. Vice of Hope. Yes, in Italian, Il Vizio della Speranza. The Vice of Hope, and it's a movie that's set in、uh, suburb Napoli, kind of a lowless area where there's human trafficking and prostitution. A place called Castel Volturno. Its heroine is Maria, a girl that essentially works to take these usually、uh, foreign refugee women pregnant, and they're gonna give birth. And usually these babies are already, let's say, they're gonna be sold. To、um, to some bourgeois Italian families. So is it a, like a surrogacy story?、Uh, yeah, it's it's a surrogacy story, but also about prostitution, about lawless, about a lawless area.、Mm. Uh, so this the story gets its turning point because our protagonist Maria、uh, discovers she herself, who thought that could not have children, is actually pregnant. So this this new turn in her life changes. Her view on her life, on her job.、Uh, it's a very interesting movie because the the camera follows Maria's character all the way. It's a it's a steady shot, but it's very dynamic. And I understand the film played really well on the festival circuit and it won some awards. A few days ago, it won、uh, the Audience Award in the Rome Film Festival. And actually,、uh, right now, while we're speaking, we were checking the results for the Tokyo Film Festival, and this film w-、uh, won both、uh, for Best Actress, so Pina Turco playing Maria's character, and、uh, Best Director Eduardo De Angelis. Just won in Tokyo, and we were joking about that because I had the chance to meet them and talk to them, and they were leaving Sunday, last Sunday.、Uh, I asked them what happens if you're going to win, if any of you is going to win, and they were like, "Oh, we'll put them on the first、um, plane to Tokyo."、Uh, but I, I'm not. I don't know. I have to check if they really came back here for the award. They didn't ask you to go up in their place. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. I'm a little bit. I resent that. So, what was the audience reaction when you saw the film?、Uh, the audience reaction was very emotional because this film's、uh, characteristic is has a very intense music.、Uh, the music is composed by an Italian artist called Enzo Avitabile. Actually, Jonathan Demi did a documentary on him, so he's、uh, an interesting um, um, composer and also the director's friend. 
this music is mixing a lot of elements. So it mixes Napolitan music, it mixes jazz, it mixes African music. Mm-hmm. So it really translates into music the atmosphere of this land with all different people from different uh, continents and uh, dynamic uh, and also violent moments. So it sounds quite a, a bleak film. Is that right? Uh, actually, if you read it on paper, it sounds bleak. But then um, there's this music, and actually, there's uh, there the the characters has a um, has a dog that's really really good. I don't I, I don't know if it's a natural thing. I think they used a, a trainer that was very professional. Uh, so there's this dog that's it's a big like mastiff, but it's has its kind of cute moments, and uh, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of colors. So it ends up not being a bleak movie, and most of all, there is as the title says, the hope, which is something that these people maybe should not have, should forget, but they cannot help but having. So it's a very positive movie. And uh, I think it was you telling me that uh, originally the director of this film was championed by the, the Serbian director, um, Kusturica. Yes. Uh, he uh, was, Kusturica, Emil Kusturica, was the producer of his first film, which is called uh, Mozzarella Stories. Uh, which is uh, yeah, <laughs> which is a story of a uh, mozzarella factory, uh, Italian factory that gets the competition of a big Chinese factory in copying the mozzarella. So it's grotesque, also funny, but also very intense. And uh, Kusturica allegedly told him, uh, "Never stop doing movies that are like you." To Eduardo De Angelis, um, I was, I'm kind of wondering about the uh, cultural aspect of the movie. I mean, it says it takes it takes place in Napoli. So it's Napoli, but it's the suburbs of Napoli, and uh, as I said, uh, it's kind of a lawless place where um, not even mafia is like really theft, prostitution. It's it's really like a um, Western kind of scenario. But the thing that it's interesting, it's still a movie that's we could consider Italian because given the premise you wouldn't expect it but there's a lot of eating there's a lot of food in this movie so there's one scene where this um, amazing character this this um, Aunt Marie Zia Marie who is this woman who uh, everybody calls auntie but she's not aunt to anyone she's basically a mafia boss Mm. but woman and so she's um maneuvering all the so like the mother in animal kingdom yes yes exactly exactly so she's preparing the food for the women they're gonna um cross the river which is a very dangerous river they're gonna cross the river to go and uh, give birth and so they need to eat they need to be in uh, their full strength so she's cooking this i i checked because i thought there were meatballs but actually they were gnocchi so potato and uh, and flour uh, with this deep tomato sauce, and there's this scene where they're in in this really rough uh, river ride. They started eating this um, this this dish, and it looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking or wondering about. Um, you said that all right. So it's the suburbs of Napoli, and it's kind of a lawless area. And I was looking at the description of the movie, and it says that it's like the seaside of the area, which is very different for me as an American. If you think a lawless town, it's almost always inner city. Suburbs are where you go to escape the lawlessness, whereas people in the city have been left to their own devices. And that's really interesting to me because the aesthetic qualities of the movie will, I mean, they'll change by necessity. And that, I think that that actually lends itself to a really, um, like you said, it's a movie that has a lot of hopelessness, but there's still beauty in it. There's, in, in the food, in what I'd, I guess the scenery, the, um, just the surroundings would be beautiful, even if the situation itself is terrible. Yeah, f- first of all, it's a uh, lowless area, it's the seaside, because of the the position, the situation for Italy. So a lot of refugees, a lot of um, illegal immigrants would be coming from the sea. And so you see the clash between what's considered Italian, meaning pretty, meaning beautiful, and what's the real situation there. And you you find a different beauty. You don't find the beauty of historical monuments. You find the beauty of this people that are in a kind of a hopeless life, but trying to find uh, some kind of kindness, some kind of tenderness, some kind of unity in this uh, situation. 
Uh, so yeah, def- it's, I think it's a very interesting point. Is it a realistic acting style that the actors go for? Or? Yes, uh, director uh, Eduardo De Angelis clearly says that he's not interested in uh, uh, non-professional actors being natural. He thinks that natural is a state that you acquire after a lot of practice. Mm. So, for example, Pina Turco, the actress who plays Maria, she had a physical training before the movie. So for for weeks, uh, she would train herself to uh, take a boat uh, across this uh, very impetuous river because it's not a river that's supposed to be crossed by boats or uh, hiking up and down in the mud. So that every day, so Maria's life, we as we see it in the movie, it's her everyday doing. So she's doing her errands and she has to look really natural that, like she's actually doing it every day. So Eduardo uh, De Angelis was very keen on uh, uh, portraying that as naturally as possible. Yeah, so given the film's success, it sounds as though it will get a distributor here in Japan. Well, hopefully, yes. I didn't hear about um, any distribution yet, but I think given the, the incredible awards, two awards for this film, there should be uh, distribution. Uh, let's say it probably will come in two years, maybe. <laughs> So, from our first Italian offering to a second Italian film, this time from Paolo Sorrentino, who's uh, a particular favorite of, of mine. He's a, I think you could describe him best as an iconoclast, as an iconoclastic director. Um, yeah, to say he, the least, yes. yes. And this particular film centers around uh, Silvio Berlusconi, or at least uh, a character who's very similar to Silvio Berlusconi, correct? Well, I think that a lot of people uh, took it as Silvio Berlusconi. They didn't uh, think that it was a character based on. Well, the film begins with a, a, a big disclaimer. If you remember, before anything happens in the film, it begins with this disclaimer that this is a work of a poet's imagination. Mm-hmm. And that that disclaimer out of the way, it then turns into what it turns <laughs> into. <laughs> so I guess if you were trying to kind of um, explain this quickly to, to someone thinking of seeing it. It's a film about a character uh, who's very similar to Silvio Berlusconi. His name is Silvio, played by the great Tony Savillo, really the star of, I think, all of the Italian films that uh, Sorrentino's made. Isn't it? Almost all, uh, with the exception of the ones that he shot with American actors, like Youth or This Must Be the Place. Otherwise, yes, all of his films, or his feature films, have... Uh, Sonny Servillo as the protagonist. What I found interesting uh, reading about this film is that originally in Italy it screened as two films, correct? Yes, in Italy it was thought as two films distributed uh, with an interval of uh, 10 days, almost three weeks, so people could uh, see one and um, have a little bit of time and, and, and watch the second one. So it was like the project of having two different movies of uh, 90 minutes each. So it was Loro Uno, Loro Due. And here in Tokyo, it screens as one film. This is a kind, I think this is the cut that they showed in Toronto, right? I think this was the cut that was um, thought to be eligible for, uh, for being candidate to Oscar, to the mm-hmm. Academy Award. So I think it was an international version um, that was... Uh, so it's not just the two films together, but it's a, it's a cut version. Right, it runs about two and a half hours? Yes, yes. Okay, well, I know we're all very excited to talk about this film. Uh, after the screening, the three of us came out and all tried not to tell each other what we thought of it. Chris, I'm going to you first. Uh, what was your impression of the film? Oh, man, I, I'm, I'm not even sure how to <laughs> approach this. Um, I loved the movie itself. Everything about it was pretty much as over the top as you can get without becoming like a rated X kind right. of thing. It, it's uh, definitely a Sorrentino movie, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 but it was wonderful. Um, I mean, just the way that everything was played out. I found myself very enraptured by the characters themselves, and that's saying a lot because there's a ton of nudity in this film. Just so much nudity. There, there is a lot of nudity, it's true. And, and eventually... And, and pretty much from the beginning. From the very <laughs> beginning. There, is, there are like three different breasts from three different women, but... By the end of the movie, you're kind of like, okay, that's cool. I love seeing breasts and everything, but I really want to get to the next plot point. I really want to hear the next monologue because it's just fascinating. The characters themselves, everything surrounding the characters, both 
fictional and quote unquote fictional, just everything just comes together. And um, I think you both said it ran for about two and a half hours. It feels like half the length of time when you're watching it. Yeah, I have a lot to say, so I'm gonna I'm gonna calm down right now. <laughs> Well, now we've learned something about Chris. Uh, <laughs> let's let's throw it to Maria. How was the film received in Italy? Well, actually, in Italy, I think everybody hated it, really? uh, both from uh, left-oriented critics and right-oriented critics, and mostly, I think, because the film uh, kind of humanizes Berlusconi's character, Berlusconi's figure, when um, the uh, the exact opposite is what happens, because we have to remember that even though he's still officially on a ban from public office until 2019, uh, he presented himself candidate for the 2018 elections, uh, even though he could not technically be premier or being um, an official politician. It starts with this... Lamb wandering into uh, what we later find out is Berlusconi's uh, villa. But he really, the director really throws us into the story pretty quickly. The typical Sorrentino thing, which is the animal with a sheep that uh, gets into the house and dies of freezing because of the like air con. Dies exposure or something. Yes, yes. But that is a pun that's understandable for Italians because the film is uh, set roughly for the third time that Berlusconi was a prime minister, so mm. between 2006 and 2009, so the time that brought his retirement. But quite recently, one of his strategies for him to be popular again was to appeal to uh, vegan and vegetarian people so the campaign was for Easter, since we uh, we eat lamb, uh, was this posters where he was holding a lamb and saying that this cruelty had to stop. Naturally, there were a lot of gifts and a lot of um, uh, you know co- comical rendering of it with the caption for the lamb saying, "Help me." <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw the the sheep, I immediately thought about that. I didn't know anything about that. That's really interesting. I just thought it was kind of like a throwaway gag at the beginning of the movie to kind of like contrast the lamb to what happens when he enters. But that's interesting. Yeah, the the thing with this director is he loves to have animals in his films. As much as Yorgos Lanthimos, the, the Greek director, and we'll probably talk about him on the next show. Um, yeah, let's bo- remind in The Great Beauty there's a flamingos no, yes, and there's the, the giraffe. And, and, uh, yeah. Were you guys bothered by the lack of exposition? Were you able to follow what was going on, Chris? Oh, yeah, I followed it very easily. And that's actually one of the, uh, I guess, the best compliments I could pay to the movie. Everything about the movie was organized in a way that made it very clear who the characters were and what the stakes were for each character. So even when you saw a character at the beginning that seemed like maybe a throwaway, like some random character, later on they come back and you're reminded instantly of what they were doing prior in the movie. I guess the best example for me, for the continuity, I completely forgot the character's name. The older man with the glasses who wants to replace Berlusconi. And he gets Koopa Uh, Kayafa to support him. And then she goes behind his back and tells Silvio, quote unquote, Mr. Silvio. She tells him this guy's plans. When the guy comes to him. Needing help. Needing help. And this is like way later into the movie. But immediately, you can understand exactly what's going yeah, on, exactly set, what's happening. It's, in that case, it's set up, but it's not telegraphed. It's not saying, this will be important information later on. Exactly, um, exactly. Yeah, one of the criticisms of the film was that some, some people found it incoherent. There was just too much going on and it was hard to follow. I don't know. I certainly didn't have that problem with it. I always find with this particular director that he throws you into the action. And if you don't necessarily know a little bit about the context, you could be lost. Mm. Um, that, that was certainly something I felt when in the previous film uh, called Il Divo, it was also about a, an Italian prime minister. Um, in this case, it was Andreotti and Tony Savillo, again, playing that role. Absolutely fantastic in it. But the film sort of assumes that you know about Andreotti, about his uh, so-called links with the, the mafia. Uh, I see. And if you don't know about that, it could be a little bit hard. I, I really thought that was, I, I benefited from having read a, a, a really great book on the same subject. I think that the narrative approach of using the character Sergio Mora as the analog to Berlusconi, or like the, the person who's following in his footsteps in a way, who's chasing the same ambition, 
I think that that really helped tell the story. So we should explain a little bit about that plot line. So the film begins, at least uh, the first of the, the two films, if you saw them separately, begins with a man who is essentially pimping people out and later on is going to bring himself as close to, to Berlusconi's character as possible in order to, to seek a, a, a rise in his status. He's looking to find a way up. He's trying to, you know, so climb, he the, climb the ladder. He, play, he basically realizes that he's doing in a smaller dimension what Berlusconi is already doing. So it's like, I might as well go to the source. I might as well go to the master because I'm doing this very well in my little circuit, mm -hmm. which is gathering beautiful girls and using them to bribe politicians and to uh, create a, a circle. And this is what essentially was happening with the real Berlusconi, which was creating this, this pool for uh, toxic uh, fluidity between media, TV, cinema, politics. So this pool of beautiful girls, it was, the stakes were high because if you played your cards right, not only you could have beautiful jewelry or bags, but you could get a uh, European parliament uh, deputy or get a... Uh, that, that actually happened. That actually happened. Uh, yes, it actually happened. There was uh, Mara Carfagna, who was a uh, European parliamentarian, and uh, she she caused uh, indirectly she caused the scandal that the, f the film is not directly referring to, which is um, Berlusconi's wife being upset, being publicly upset. And in in real life, Veronica Lario, ex actress who was um, more than twenty years uh, Berlusconi's wife, she wrote a public open letter on Corriere della Sera, which is one of the main newspapers, newspapers saying that uh, Silvio had overstepped his line and she wanted her dignity back, which is a word that comes back a lot in the movie. Or there was Nicole Minetti. Nicole Minetti, she was working in the uh, Lombardia region. And she, she, her previous experience was she was, she was working in a, in a dental studio. And that's how he met Berlusconi. Because I don't know if, um, how, how much that was publicized. But Berlusconi was attacked with a statue, the real Berlusconi. We're not talking about Paolo, Paolo Sorrentino movie. So reality sometimes is scarier than, <laughs> than fiction. So he was hit by, after uh, they said he was a crazy man, uh, with a statue of the Duomo. And he broke his, to his tooth. So that's why he went to this dental studio with those Nicole Minetti. So she's a little bit close to the character play by Katnia Smutniak because she was collecting, she was gathering all the girls. So this pimp. Okay, Scamarcio. 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 So Scamarcio, the actor, Scamarcio. Ricardo is Scamarcio, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. He's yes. the guy. He's the guy with the amazing eyes in Master of None. It's the boyfriend of the the Italian. Yeah, lady. yeah. He's just uh, this kind of like Tony Curtis character, and in fact, the plot more or less mirrors a Sweet Smell of Success. Sweet Smell of Success is about a guy, this sort of low-level guy who's trying to make it big. Uh, and this guy is doing the same stuff, you know, and he, he almost looks like Tony Curtis in a lot of the scenes, I thought. Yeah, another thing that, that you mentioned, Maria, is the, the nexus between the media and the politicians. And I wanted to ask Chris a little bit about this. There's a lot of similarities between what was going on in the, the world of the film and the, uh, the relationship uh, between uh, celebrity and politics in your country. Yes, to any American who... Is, who has a chance to see this movie or anyone who's familiar with American political culture and the current political climate, you will see a lot of parallels between this movie and what you see on any news network anywhere in America. This almost plays as a behind-the-scenes look at the current presidential administration. From the rise to success up to and through the administration itself. So when Maria said that a lot of people in Italy hated this movie, I actually understood why. Because I could maybe superimpose Trump over Berlusconi, the Berlusconi character. And if someone tried to humanize him in that way during such a scandalous period in his presidency, it would make pretty much everyone mad. Yeah, I, I'm, I take issue with the idea of humanizing someone who's essentially a pantomime character. Mm. I mean, the guy, his first appearance is a man caked in makeup, <laughs> with, uh, you know, his, his hair's fake, everything about the guy is fake. Now, that's the point. So saying that that's humanizing him, I mean, I, I understand you guys are talking about the criticism, but 
you know, I, I don't think that the film really does humanize him, I think. And it doesn't demonize him. It yeah, doesn't, yeah. it plays, it walks the line. Mm. It really does walk the line so that you, you see this man, I think in the way that we see a lot of politicians on TV, uh, you don't really know what they stand for. Mm. In fact, did you really learn a lot about this character during the film? Actually, I would say that while I didn't learn a lot about the actual person that this character is portraying, I do think that I learned about that character. So yeah, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, I guess this movie, from my perspective, was about a young, younger man who looked up and aspired to be a person who is not exactly an aspirational figure. Uh, um, <laughs> not really <laughs> sure how else to put that. Uh, nicely, nicely put. <laughs> he uses his own talents, which just happen to be in the field of procuring women and making them do certain things. He uses those talents to get ahead, and he finally realizes that maybe he should use that power to gain political power. One thing that I thought was really interesting is that his story was supposed to mirror the story of Berlusconi's entry into uh, politics. But what's interesting about it for me is that Berlusconi in the movie actually is leaving that era behind in a way. So the guys coming in, and, and there's this tension in the, in the second act where Sergio Moro, the guy who's trying to get into Berlusconi's inner circle, he is throwing these elaborate parties, he's putting all of this effort into... And a lot of money. A lot of money, a lot of money, into meeting Berlusconi. And Berlusconi, is, he's, he's trapped in his own mind where he's trying to think of, should he return to politics? Is he too old? Does he have the skills to get back into the game? And he's going through a crisis of conscience that only gets worse with this introduction of this new guy who wants to be like him. And it was really, really interesting to me. Like I said, from an outsider perspective, it was really interesting to see that as a character arc because you rarely see a bad, well, a morally ambiguous person try to reform themselves and get dragged back by a protagonist, you know? Like, I mean, there's the one iconic, for me, it's iconic. It was just amazing. The party with all those women. And it's just like 28 women or 30 women, Berlusconi, Mora, and that's it. It's, it's like a blank field, like an empty field at night. And there's nothing else. You, you see nothing else. And it was just like, why would you want this? <laughs> like, what could you do with this? And throughout that scene, you start to realize, oh, this is what he wants. It's not just about the money and the power and the women. It's about Berlusconi wanting to feel as though he has that influence once again. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's you know, there's that kind of like King Lear thing. It's like, I still matter. I still, I'm still important. My favorite monologue in that movie is the one where he's talking to, again, forgot the guy's name with the glasses, but when he's like, there's only one self-made man in Italy, me. <laughs> it was so good. Yeah, you know, I, when I think of other films by this director, I don't really think of the monologues. I think of these big visuals. Um, he, he works with, just a good time to, to mention the cinematographer, Luca Bagazzi. He's a terrific DP, and I think they've worked together on just about everything. The, the photography really kind of emphasizes the debauchery uh, mm -hmm. and, he's, he's, and, and sometimes the loneliness of, the, of a particular character. And this could be in any of the films. And I, I really love the way that the visuals kind of reinforce the themes. But, you know, I don't think of Sorrentino and think of, of these monologues until this film, which has several long monologues. Yeah. It has some dialogue and a lot of monologues. The one I just want to pick up on because I just thought it was so, so great. There's a scene where, by the way, some of this may sound like spoilers, but honestly, you cannot spoil this film. Yeah, there's, you really can. There's nothing that has not either been in the newspapers or is, is something you need to, you know, to actually see. But there's a scene where the fading Lothario, he feels, you know, he's he's got to show that his powers are still intact. So he makes a phone call to um, a woman just randomly from the telephone book and calls her to show that he is the superior salesman. He just randomly calls someone and says, I'm, I'm going to make you a proposal. Okay, I'm building this property. And then he talks about it like 
this is something he's he's been developing for for years. He has all this psychology built into the way he talks to people. It's an amazing, amazing scene, and it goes for a long time. Yeah, and it's yeah. an opportunity for Sevilla to really show what he's capable of. But you were mentioning that um, Sevilla actually slipped into his Napoli accent for that. Yes, because we have to remember that Tony Servillo is Neapolitan. So his natural, he doesn't really speak dialect because he's a trained actor, but in his accent you can really uh, hear that he's Neapolitan. So in this movie he is actually doing a Milanese guy, because Silvio Berlusconi is from Milano, a Milanese guy is singing a Napoli song with a Milanese accent. So he's doing a lot of uh, uh, double tricks. <laughs> and like the, the like the monologues, there's also a lot of songs. There's a lot of uh, yes, Sevilla yes. singing songs yes, to yes. captive audiences in this film. Yes, and actually there's a scene, Una Domenica Bestiale, which is the song that Veronica uh, wants him to remember. He, f he pretends he doesn't remember, but then he remembers, and there's the guy who's the actual singer, Fabio Concato, singing it in the big villa. Yeah, so, it's so a, for, for Italians, it's a, it's, there's a lot of... I mean, what's so great about that scene is that you've got, you've got the original singer singing the song and, and Silvio has a hired hand on his, uh, at his villa who is a balladeer who just follows him around and plays <laughs> songs and he looks so sad. And I was like, why does he look so sad? And you nudged me and said, oh, that's the guy who wrote the song. <laughs> yes, that's, that was Fabio Concato, the, the oh. writer and the actual singer of the song. So he, there's a lot of people doing cameos in this film. So if you're Italian, you have to, this kind of uh, little details there, um, entertaining. Going back to the uh, Tony Servillo thing, it's really interesting because when he's doing the monologues, he's really, really passionate actor moment. So he forgets that he should be doing a Milanese accent and he goes back to his Napolitan accent. I felt that was very interesting. There was the ultimate thing that showed that he was really into his character. I think the, the, the problem, um, it's, it's not really a problem. It's uh, difficult for people who are Italian or familiar with the Italian politics or what happened in Italy in the past 20 years to dissociate herself, himself, from what happens. And this is really what's, probably it's, a, it's the, the weakness of the movie. It's not Sorrentino's fault. He probably managed uh, material that was too alive, too fiery. You could argue that the, the theme of the film is where do we go wrong? Remember somebody says that in the film, where do we go wrong? Yeah. And, and, and nobody can seem to put their finger on exactly the moment where things changed. Um, this has been something, the, the, you know, this connection between celebrity and politics and people trying, you know, sycophants and people trying to build themselves into something they're not. This has been going on for a long time. I mean, in let's, let's, not forget, uh, let's not forget it. Everything started with him owning media, sports, and then going to politics. Mm -hmm. I think this is the man that paved the way to do this, unfortunately. You know, for people who are not familiar with Berlusconi, it, it was always about somebody who talked in perfect sound bites about change and making things wonderful and, and you know promises promise lots of, lots and lots of empty promises but never really put forward any policies um and never really developed any kind of ideology it was all surface it's all shallow the, the ideology of the ideology of um looking good uh enjoying life having money and this is something that uh, kind of uh, shaped up a whole generation. Again, just to bring it back to American politics, let's look at what's going on now. Let's look at let's look at Trump. I mean, I am not going to give my own personal take because I don't feel as though this is the place for that. However, I will say that factually, Trump has been a very Berlusconi-esque type of figure. I mean, and I'm talking about back in the 80s. You know, yeah. He brought the idea of back in uh, Back to the Future two times. Back to the future, yeah. Back to the Future two, where we had like Biff Tannen as like the right. analog, and like he brought the he or not brought, but he embraced the idea of being both wealthy and a celebrity, and rolling in those circles, and money being the most important aspect of humanity. And his takeaway from that from the 80s and the 90s was that very idea we should all uh, we should all strive to have more wealth more status more power yeah and that's what he sold to the american public and at the end of the day that's what berlusconi was he was a businessman he was yeah. a salesman and he sold a dream he right 
it, 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 enough people a, bought a it. A dream that doesn't exist literally in the film. It exactly. Exactly. There is it no was, apartment. Exactly. The apartment doesn't exist. He made everything up out of whole cloth, but that woman was tempted to buy that apartment that, again, didn't exist. One, one other thing that I really want to touch on is the, is the aesthetic. So at this villa, there are trampolines. There are magic castles made of plastic. There's a carousel. I mean, there's all and these the volcano. Fun, and there's, of course, the, <laughs> the infamous volcano. I don't want to talk about the volcano because it's right at the end. But yeah, they keep talking about throughout the film. If, you, if, you, if you're nice to me, I'll, I'll show you I'll my show volcano. I'll show you the volcano. <laughs> But um, yeah, I think it's that is one aspect of the film I love that the cheesiness and the fakery is all there. You're physically in the in the uh, in the garden, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I mean that's kind of like when I got that's kind of when I got it right. when I got the aesthetic yeah. where it was just all fake, all goofy. There's too much space and not enough people to fill it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's and a great point. it's just like oh, this is what this guy wants. This is. This is his final goal, and I just really, really like that because it was something that was shown and not told. And as an audience member, as as a viewer of this film, it's up to you to figure out all of the characters' um, motivations. I just really, really like that. What, what, what he really shows is that Berlusconi himself might be gone, but unfortunately, the Berlusconism, so the way that things are perceived, the, the money, the politics, the way that uh, you arrive to power, and um, the, the culture of use, it, or use or sex or beauty being a currency. Unfortunately, he built that, and it's gonna take a few generations to wipe it away. You've been listening to The Last Picture House. We'll be back again in two weeks' time with another episode. Thanks for listening.